Let's please stand and sing the chorus. This is the day that the Lord hath made. <clears throat> this is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. <clears throat> Lead me to Calvary. <coughs> Stand up for Jesus while you're sitting down. I'll, I'll give you a break. Sit down, sit down for Jesus. How's that? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Be soldiers on the cross. Lift eyes, royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is born indeed. Stand up. Stand up. 
to thee, this will be our offering him. <clears throat> Oh, 
No one ever cared for me like Jesus. At the cross, we had to change this morning. There was one that uh, did not match what the songbook said. So. At the cross. <clears throat> for our Savior dying on the cross, taking our sins upon Him so that we might have eternal life. Lord, I just thank You for that blood that was shed. Lord, sometimes we just need to pause and just go back to that scene, the cross, the agony that Christ suffered for each one of us. Lord, and then go back to the day that day of our salvation and think of the joy, the peace that we had. Lord, and we need to bring that back into our churches, into our homes today, Lord. That joy and peace that only you can 
bring to us. Lord, this morning we just lift up Miss Judy as she comes. Lord, we know that there's a message in this song and I just pray that we would each not listen to Judy and the beautiful voice that she has, Lord, but listen to the message that you have for us in this song, Lord. Lord, in our pastor as he comes to follow and open up the Holy Bible, Lord. Lord, even now, even at this moment, add to or take away anything that we need to hear. Spit those that are unable to be with us this morning. Just pray for those that are here, if there's a decision to be made, Lord. Let us pray that you would, you would uh, burden that heart this morning. In your sweet name.
Last week we began looking again at the cross of Christ and the cries that Jesus said prior to his death. Last week we looked at Matthew chapter 27, 46, and we'll continue that again uh, this week. Just on kind of a, a way of refresher so that you kind of keep up with us. We said this last week, during Jesus' 33 years on earth, he enjoyed an unbroken fellowship with the Father. Never a thought that was not approved by God the Father. Never a moment that was outside of his presence. But now the hiding of God's face from him was the most bitter cup he had to drink. He now understands each forsaken individual because Jesus has felt that pain himself. You know this. According to Jewish tradition, a new day began at 6 a.m. So Jesus was crucified at the third hour, which would have been at 9 o'clock in the morning. So for three hours, he hung in that morning in sunlight. And then at the sixth hour, midday, darkness spread over the land. In Matthew chapter 27, 45, it says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. At noon, the world became dark, and what a darkness that had to be. You and I know this, that darkness is associated with the judgment of God for sin. Here we see the judgment of God against evil men who treated Jesus with so much hatred. And you might say we stand condemned with him, for it was our sins as well that put Jesus on the cross. The darkness came because of the guilt of us all. But there is another reason for the darkness. It represents a judgment of the Father against His Son. In those dark hours, Jesus became legally guilty for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For He hath made Him, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We talked about that last week, and we said this, Sin was not pushed away, but it was put away. And thank God for that. My sin and your sins was put away. Now, which brings us back to where we need to be this, uh, this day. We talked about that bitter cry that Jesus says. So stand with me as we look at Matthew 27 and verse number 46. Matthew 27 in verse number 46. About the ninth hour, or about noontime, Jesus, about the morning time, excuse me, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The question before us is this. I want you to look up here, and if you've never thought about this, this would be a good time to entertain it. Did Jesus suffer as a man, or did Jesus suffer as God? Someone said this, that a God who cannot suffer is a God who cannot love. If God cannot feel all the pain of His people, we might be tempted to say He's indifferent to our pain. If only the humanity of Christ suffered at the cross, we might think it only a man who died on the cross. Listen to this. Jesus could not suffer as a man without suffering as God. Keep in mind that Jesus was not forced to suffer. He chose to suffer. God chose to redeem us through the suffering of Jesus Christ. It was like this. The Father chose to be accepted by some, and He chose to be rejected by others. Now let me show you this before we pray. In that statement in Matthew 27, He says... My God, my God, the sweet communion, was, sweet communion was gone. But Jesus did know that the Father's presence would return. And this, the withdrawal of His Father's presence did not mean the withdrawal of His Father's love. Can I tell you this? We might not understand it all, but I'm here to tell you. I thank God every single day that God loves us. And let me, let me, look up here. Let's not be ashamed. He loves us in spite of who we are. Listen. He loves us in spite of what we do. 
It's an amazing kind of love, and it's an amazing kind of a Savior. So with the remaining time I'll have, we're just going to ask God's blessing upon the reading of His text, and hopefully before we leave, we can honestly say we've been in the presence of God Himself. Father, we thank You for the opportunity that I have to study this grand book, to pull back the pages each week and see the truth of the living Word of God. Father, we know no one is worthy because only You are. But You gave us the opportunity to come to know You so that we might experience Your righteousness. Father, for the brief moments that I'll have today, and Father, they will be brief, I ask that you give me exactly what we need for this hour. Father, there are those that have struggled this week. There are those that are tired. There are those, Lord, that had to battle certain entities. Maybe work has been pressurized, and maybe there's a situation at home that has just gotten out of control, and maybe there's something, Lord, that has been said that injured you or hurt your heart. Father, I pray that we can listen to the words of of the sweet communion of God and find comfort that we need. Lord, we're going to give you the credit and all glory that is 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 will be said today. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Before you sit down, tell two people you love them before you sit down. There's a Bible scholar. His name is Arthur Pink. And Arthur Pink said these words. Talking about Matthew chapter 27. This was a cry of distress, but not of distrust. So the question before us is this. Why was the son forsaken by the father in the first place? And we find that answer, believe it or not, in the Old Testament. Turn, if you will, to Psalm chapter 22 and verse number 1. Psalm chapter 22 and verse number 1. And we start to find out some things that we really need to investigate in our study this morning. Psalm chapter 22 and in verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and not silent. But thou art holy. O oh, thou art in inha- oh, thou inhabitants the praises of Israel. The father forsook his son because of this. Look up here. Don't ever forget this. The father forsook Jesus on the cross because, number one, his holiness required it. Number one, His holiness required it. The prophet Nahum asked a question that if you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, I'll invite you to see this maybe with fresh eyes. Here is a question that needs to be answered and will answer it in the light of our study this morning. In Nahum chapter 1 and verse number 6, turn there if you will, that is in the Minor prophet of the Old Testament. You might have to blow the dust off your Bible to find it. Because not a lot of people read these minor prophet books. But let me show you a question that was asked. Nahum chapter 1 verse number 6. Now watch this. Who can stand before his indignation? Number 1. That's a question. And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Number 2. His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Mark that. What does that mean? Listen to this. Only Jesus could withstand the wrath of God. Only Jesus could take the wrath that we deserve. Amen? Look what he writes. Who can stand before his indignation? In other words, 
Who in the world could take this wrath? And the answer, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth. There is only one individual that has ever walked the face of the earth that can take the wrath of God the Father and His Son, Jesus It was His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, why would He do that? Let me just tell you this. Why would He do that? Everyone has to look in the mirror to find that answer. Because Jesus loved us so much that He didn't want us to have the wrath of God upon us. So He took that away from us so that we could know His righteousness. Now, listen to this. It has been said that Jesus experienced on the cross what a lost sinner will experience in hell. Maybe you didn't hear that. It has been said that Jesus on the cross experienced what a lost sinner will experience in hell. For instance, darkness, abandonment, forsaken, thirst, and pain. And separation. But what Jesus experienced during those darkened hours on the cross was all for us. Jesus was receiving what was due to us. It was said that indescribable sin was in contact with infinite holiness and infinite justice. Now something that, 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 that maybe you have pondered or, or maybe uh, this will be fresh to you but this. How in the world, watch this, how in the world could man kill God? Wait a minute. Everybody look up here. How in the world could man kill God? There is no way that that could be humanly possible. You can't kill God. The answer is he willingly laid down his life for us. Jesus selected the time. And Jesus selected the place. And why? Why would he go through all of that? Because let me just tell you this, quite frankly, listen to this. Quite frankly, we don't deserve it, but that's where grace comes in. The grace of God covers that. You see, we don't deserve what Jesus did for us, but that's where Jesus handed us a big portion of His grace and said, I love you this much, and all you have to do is take this grace of God, grace through faith. We understand it was midday, or somebody described it like this. It was midnight at midday. I like that. Darkness was a symbolic of the separation of His heavenly Father who is light. Listen to me. God the Father is light, but God the Son died in darkness. And it, it, that, that's so interesting to me. The lost sinner will be, will be thrown into outer darkness. So what does that mean? That Jesus suffered the darkness for each one who will call upon His name for salvation. You don't have to go through the darkness. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to suffer separation, thirst, and all of those things that we listed. Because Jesus has already done that for you. Friend, I want to tell you, He's done everything that He possibly can to secure your salvation. Jesus suffered hell on the cross just for you. In His lifetime, Jesus suffered at the hands of sinful man. At the hands of Satan, now He suffered at the hand of God the Father. Matthew 27, 47 says this. And some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. Others said, the rest of them said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come and save him. The comment about Elijah or Elias here was made in scorn. The Jews would have known about my God, my God. They would have understood that. But can I show you something that you might not have understood? Or never under, uh, uh, thought about. Tell me if you're ready. Are you really ready? When Psalm 22 was written. It talked about a crucifixion that would come. Are you with me? Why is that significant? Because of this. In the Old Testament. Crucifixion wasn't done. Crucifixion was done by stoning. So when this psalm was penned, they had to look at this and say, what are they talking about? It wasn't even known about crucifixion when this was written. 
So years and years and years before Jesus hung on the cross to die on crucifixion, it was already stated what would happen. And any Jew that understood the law, the Torah, would understand that uh, Psalm chapter 22 spoke about Christ. If they really understood the Bible, if they really understood the Scripture, they would have had to understand this man fulfilled every obligation that the Bible spoke about. Isn't that amazing? I'm telling you this morning. You and I in this church. And many that will be watching this at a later published date. We take so for granted our salvation. We wake up in the morning and we know that we're saved. We go to work and we're saved. And we go to sleep at night and we know that we're saved. Yet we, we do not appreciate the great gift that was given to us on the cross. We fail to recognize what it cost us so that you and I could obtain heaven on Christ's account. Listen, I don't know about you, but when Jesus died on the cross, He gave me a rare opportunity and said this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It did not say might be saved. It didn't say that it, you, you, you could be. It says shall be saved. Meaning this. You can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Even today. That's amazing. That's amazing to me. That the very God of heaven. The very God who created this all. The very God who planted every tree. And the tree that he would die on. Jesus did that all. Come on, for you, for you. Now, are you ready for this? When we come to church, basically there's a type of people that will come to church. There are those that will come to church with a pen and paper in their hand and scribe down some notes. There are some that will look at their phone and Facebook. Now, you didn't think I knew that. Uh, There are some that will kind of force their eyes open. Not that they're really here, but they're just kind of sort of here. But there are those that will come and say, Speak to me, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Jesus did not go to the cross For us to be indifferent for his word. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid in our churches today we become indifferent to the word of God. I'm afraid that the message of redemption has never taken hold as it needs to take hold. Because here, listen, if redemption has taken hold in your life and salvation is real in your life, there ought to be some kind of visible changes. There ought to be something that somebody could say, look, I don't know who these people are, and and I may not know them, but they have a dip. Watch this. They have a different walk, they have a different talk, and they have a different attitude than I. Jesus died on the cross not just because he didn't have anything else to do. Jesus died on the cross because he loved us that much. John Piper wrote these words Never before. Or since, has there been so much suffering? Because, in all of its dreadful severity, it was suffering by design. It was planned by God the Father and embraced by God the Son. Did you hear that? We're all familiar with this great verse, but John 15, 13 says, Greater man hath no man... Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The greatness of Christ's love for us can be measured only when we can be measured, be measured the wrath of God that was placed upon him. The cost to redeem our souls from the clutch of Satan was indescribable. And no man can write words that adequately describe the scene before us. Let me share something with you that I come very, very familiar with in these weeks we've been studying the cries of Christ of the cross as I've been studying these words and parsing these words out and 
And, and looking at the totality of this, here's what I've learned. English language fails to describe how we can understand the scene before us. You see, when we talk about the death of Jesus on the cross, here's what you think. And here's what we think. We think of Jesus hanging there on a cross. Just this man hanging there. He looks vanilla by nature. He looks kind of like a, a kind of a, a sickly kind of man. And he's hanging there with this, these things on his head, these thorns on his head. And he looks okay. He doesn't look that bad. But fa- can I tell you, that's far from what it looked like in reality. We do so much injustice. And when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, there was a separation for that moment because sin and torment and punishment was placed upon Christ just so that you in Muleshoe, Texas could have a hope of eternal life. Wow. Do you believe that Jesus Christ loves people here in this building? Yeah. What about in our city? Yeah. Jesus knew that it would be impossible that people could be saved unless he endured the cross because he was the only one that could do it. Charles Wesley, the the hymnologist, wrote these words and listen to this. The word we used to sing songs like this years ago. The song is called And Can It Be? And the lyrics said this And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now think about this. Jesus must either inflict punishment or he must assume it. One more time. Jesus must inflict punishment or he must assume it. He chose the latter. Jesus went through darkness so that we could have light. He was crushed that we might be blessed. He was condemned so that you and I will be able to say, as the writer of Romans said in Romans 8.1, these words, look on the screen this morning, Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Listen to this. I am not going to be condemned. I can't be condemned because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I've appropriated it. I have fixed that. I have said, I want what Jesus has offered to me. And that's eternal life with Jesus Christ my Lord. You know what? According to that verse, I cannot be condemned. Why? Because Jesus was condemned for me. I can't be condemned for my sins. He took them away. He did what I could not do. Listen to this. There is therefore now no condemnation. Look at it. To them which are in Christ. Let me ask you this question. This is a personal question. Are you a them this morning? The only way you become a them is to know Him. That's it. You don't become a them by coming to church. You don't become a them by just reading your Bible. These are great disciplines. You don't become a them just by absolutely doing good works. You become a them by trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. And asking Him by faith to come into your life and save your soul. Is anybody getting this? This is the reason why Jesus would cry, My God, my God. C.H. Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher of yesteryear, said these words, Without the cross, there would have been a wound for which there was no ointment, a pain for which there was no balm. Sin always demands a payment. Either Jesus bears our sin or we do. There is no other choice. Either Jesus pays for your sins or, come on, you do. It is beyond my comprehension in this day and time. 
in the south in which we live, and the many times that people have heard the gospel message, and yet people still reject what Jesus has done for them. I, I, I don't understand that. Why would a rational human being choose hell over heaven? Well, preacher, nobody in their right mind would do that. You're exactly right. But the Bible says Satan has blinded the minds. Satan is a great counterfeiter. And can I tell you this? Probably one of the best members of the church is Satan himself. He comes into the church. He masquerades as somebody with light. He masquerades as somebody who's got it. And he tries to absolutely tell each and every one of you, do it. You don't need this gospel message. Put it off. You don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want this thing called salvation because if you do that, everybody will make fun of you. Come on, you don't need this. That's just a church trickery to get your money. You don't need this salvation. And can I tell you, his tactics has worked for 2,000 years. He don't change his method because it works. I'm telling you this morning, you need to be redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The Apostle Paul described that awful experience of those who will not allow the Lord of glory to come into your life. Turn, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 8. The punishment for all eternity from the Lord in His presence are way too severe to ignore. Look at these verses. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them. Look, look, look at those words again. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them. Look at this. That know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh-oh. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Maybe we don't see that near enough. Maybe we believe that we are Americans and we believe that because of our background, surely that God must want to spare us. And, and, and let me in on let me give you a secret this morning. God doesn't desire any of us to go into hell. That's not His desire. The Bible, the Apostle Paul puts it so plainly. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you are here and you know that your name is in the row book of heaven, you have something to celebrate. Did you realize this? Look, look up here just for a moment. Did you realize this? When we get together as a church family on every Sunday and your name is written in the roll book of heaven, this is a celebration. This is a celebration of all that we know. That Jesus indeed is the hero of our story. And you know what? I never get tired of reading about Jesus and I never get tired of preaching about Jesus. You know why? Because He did it all for me and He's done it all for you. And, and, and I don't know about you, but here's the grand part. All I have to do, look, 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 all I have to do is accept the gift that's being offered to me? Are you kidding me? I don't, I, look at this, I don't have to give great sums of money? No. I don't have to work myself to exhaustion? Somebody tell me. No. I don't have to gyrate and do all of this jumping jacks? No. I don't have to go to the gym every morning. Come on. No. Some of you got happy over that. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. You don't even have to quit eating your favorite food. Jesus says, I'm giving you a gift. The gift is only worthy if, the, if those that will take it will take that gift and apply it in their life. A gift is worthless if you refuse it. And this morning, the gift of eternal life is being handed out to each and every one of you in this room. Why? Because Jesus says, my God, my God, 
Why? Why? There's a lot of questions that we have on this side of heaven, isn't there? There's a lot of things that you and I want to know, isn't there? Why do good people have to suffer? Come on, everybody look up here. I'm nearly done. Don't you want to know these questions? Why do we have to go through this filth? Come on. Wouldn't it be so much greater if, if we could pray this morning and say something like this? Jesus, come on, and he would come on. Wouldn't that be awesome? But Jesus knows the time and the place. He knew that of his death, and he knows that his, the Father knows that of his coming. What that means is this. As long as Jesus leaves us here, obviously there are things that we need to do. And there's people that you need to reach. And there's people in your, in your zip code that needs the salvation that we spoke about. Let me give you this story and then I'm done. Jesus suffered darkness and hell on the cross so that we could have light. Let me tell you about an incredible lady, very brilliant lady, that was one of the unlikeliest ladies to ever come to know Christ, but she did. She was a very, 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 to say a very smart woman would be not saying it correctly. Here's a story that her heart was transformed by God in a very unlikely way. Her name is Dr. Rosalinda Pickard. She is credited with starting an entire branch of engineering science known as effective computing. But in the high school, Rosalinda was a committed atheist, leading to debates in favor of the case for evolution and dismissing those who didn't agree with her. One night, Rosalind babysit for a doctor and his wife. And they paid her at the end of the evening and they invited her to church. Rosalind bigged off, but eventually she accepted their suggestion to read the Bible. Specifically, they said, since you are so intelligent, let me tell you this. Why don't you begin in the book of Proverbs? To my surprise, she says, Proverbs is full of wisdom. I had to pause while reading and to think. Rosalind read through the entire Bible and it intrigued her. Listen to this. That she could, it intrigued her more than she could have imagined. Reading through the Bible a second time, she was conflicted. I didn't want to believe in God, she says. But I still felt a particular sense of love and presence that I could not ignore. Somebody say amen. In college, a friend invited her to church, and she made Christ the Lord of her life. Listen to what she said next of what happened. My world changed dramatically, as if in a black and white existence suddenly turned full color. I once thought I, listen to this, I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. Now I know I was an ignorant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art, and everything else there is to know. And just to think, I nearly missed it. What about her? It was that love that she saw from the Holy Bible that she could not get out of her mind. When she, when she started reading the Bible, there was words that were just powerful. She could not shake. There was something about a Creator that she once ridiculed, that she once denied, that she started reading and finally figured out there is something to a man called Jesus. A very, very brilliant, educated mind. She said, unlikely to ever find the truth of the gospel, but I did. Now it's open to all of us. You see, we may not have educated minds like this doctor did, but we have minds to make a decision on where we're going to spend eternity. Jesus cried out, my God, my God. He knew that that separation was coming he knew that life would never be the same while he was hanging on that cross. But he also knew that restoration would come. That people would have an opportunity to confess Christ. And all we'd have to do is say, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and my Savior. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? 
if you're listening on Facebook this morning, I'll make an appeal to you. You too need to come to the full awareness that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life. We spend years working ourselves into the ground and trying to make a living for our families. And yet if we miss this, we miss the very essence and the purpose of why we're here. I pray for these in this room that we not miss this grand opportunity to say, Oh God, Lord, not let me miss this opportunity. Don't let me miss this time. Don't let your education stumble you over the cause of Christ. Don't let your background stop you from experiencing who Jesus is. But most of all, don't let the devil tell you anything contrary to what you've heard this morning. This is the day that salvation could reign. Holy Father, God above all gods, King above kings, and Lord of lords, would you do something here that man cannot do? Would you bring conviction upon a heart, salvation in a home, and restoration in a mind? We ask it in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me all over the building? Brother Randy sings, this would be an opportunity for you.